This video is going to talk a little bit about how subsidies to the dairy industry work. And uh, I'm in Canada. Remarkably, if you're watching this video anywhere in the world that has access to the internet and electricity and so on, the odds are that everything I would say about Canadian dairy subsidies applies to your country as well. <laughs> um, the way that the dairy industry is subsidized in Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States is remarkably similar. And if you study the history of the legal changes in those three countries, you'll see that they've become more similar over time. All three of those countries have influenced the laws and standards of practice around the world. There are third world countries that simply directly imitate the United States in their dairy policy, in their agricultural policy generally, in their economic development policy. Um, this has most dramatically happened probably with chicken farming, where the American model of industrialized, you know, battery cage, <laughs> the, the terrible, <laughs> disgusting system of having chickens live in a steel cage their whole lives. This was really developed in the United States along with the new breeds of chickens and exported around the world. Uh, with how the dairy industry operates, you have to remember, government bureaucrats in general are not paid to come up with new ideas. Even if they're intelligent people who could be innovating new and different ways to do things, they are, on the one hand, profoundly conservative in that they're paid to keep things the same, keep things coming in under budget, and on the other hand, if anyone in the Canadian government ever asks, what should we do about the dairy industry? The first thing they're going to think of is, oh, well, how do the Americans do it? How do the British do it? Uh, how have the Americans changed their standards of practices in the last 20 years? And they will commission a report, a study, that looks at how things have changed in these other countries, look at, look at, cult at comparable examples from around the world, and then think about how can the Canadian system budge a little bit this way or that way. So... In that sense, it's not a conspiracy, but internationally, one basic model of dairy subsidy and production has been massively influential and massively imitated, um, even if it's not really successful or effective. The reason why any government would engage in a conspiracy is the need for secrecy. And it sounds crazy whenever you talk about politics in terms of a conspiracy. A lot of things sound crazy, but historically they're true. Uh, if you're under the age of 30, you've grown up your whole life with the Taliban being referred to as an enemy of the United States of America. If you're over 50 years old, you can remember a time when the Taliban and the United States were on the same side, fighting against the Soviet Union. Sounds crazy, but it's true. Coming back to my point, if I say to you... <laughs> Dairy prices are controlled by a government conspiracy in Canada. That sounds crazy. Uh, in one sense, it's not a conspiracy because we do have newspaper articles talking about the facts as they unfold. On the other hand, when you deal with what the government itself directly says and promises, it is indeed secret. And they even deny directly what it is they're doing because what they're doing is illegal under international law, under international trade agreements. So, in general, whatever the government decides to do is legal because the government writes the laws. So it is very rare that a government program will be illegal in its own country. However, countries get involved with international trade agreements, uh, organizations like the WTO, and they can rule that laws and standards and practices within a country are illegal. Canada's whole system of dairy subsidy was declared illegal by the World Trade Organization in 1999. So the government of Canada tried to change the way they do business. It was declared illegal again in the year 2002. And if you think things have changed dramatically since 2002, no, they haven't. <laughs> So the government of Canada knows that a lot of what it's doing is illegal and that they could be hauled into a court or a tribunal at any time and face further consequences for what's going on in the dairy industry. And this is not because a bunch of vegans or idealistic ecologists are criticizing the Canadian government and hauling it into court. No, this is just about money. Have you heard of money? It's popular. A lot of people care about it. 
There is a conspiracy, and I will explain why this is a conspiracy, right now in Canada to make pizza cheaper. And you know, it is a funny thing, but in most of the big cities in Canada, pizza really is the food of the poor. You can still find 99 cent pizza slices and $2 pizza slices. Um, in a country where you cannot buy a chocolate bar for $1 anymore, where $1 Canadian is really not worth very much anymore, certainly not relative to food prices. And you might raise an eyebrow and wonder why that is. Well, believe it or not, the Canadian government has a special conspiracy to make pizza cheaper. Specifically, mozzarella used for pizza has a special pricing scheme and a special subsidy. But the government of Canada can never use the word subsidy. <laughs> and this is quite complex. Every pizza restaurant in Canada has to sign an agreement with the government, sign a legal document in order to receive this benefit, in order to have taxpayers make pizza cheaper in pizza restaurants from coast to coast. So thousands and thousands of pizza restaurants have signed up for this. I have no idea why. I doubt there's a, a single pizza restaurant in Canada that on point of moral principle says, no, I'm not going to waste taxpayers' money to make myself wealthier and make my product cheaper. Um, I'm providing the link to this document where you sign up uh, in the description of this video. If you look at section 15.1, of the legal document that every pizza restaurant in Canada signs, it clarifies for you that what the Canadian government is doing uh, is not a rebate, is not a special price, and is not a reduced price for mozzarella cheese. <laughs> and that is exactly what the agreement is. Okay, and newspapers have reported on it. I'll provide some other links. Newspapers and magazines here have discussed the strange fact that the Canadian government set up this weird agreement to make pizza cheaper in this country. And this, this is not for all dairy products, not for all milk. Specifically, mozzarella pizza cheese is cheaper in Canada for, due to this program. Um, the reasons for that have to do with both this strange structure of trade disputes and also the threat that um, through a special loophole in our trade agreement with the United States, cheaper pizza cheese was being imported into Canada in a sort of gray area of the rules that a court did rule on and say, look, it's acceptable. Uh, American companies can import pizza cheese in this particular way. It's actually packaging the pizza cheese as a pizza kit. And then the Canadian Dairy Board didn't want to have to compete with these American cheese producers at a lower price, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's not because any of these people have an ethical objection to cattle living their whole lives basically in a steel cage on a concrete floor, living in misery, being impregnated with a sterile needle, being separated from their infants shortly after they're born, the infants being turned into veal, etc., etc. No, 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 no. This is not due to any moral ethics. It's about money. But it is surreal. I mean... If you signed a document saying that you were joining the Canadian military, don't you think it would be strange if that document said you are in no way employed by the Canadian military? That would be a secret agreement. It might even specify you're not going to admit to the public that you work for the Canadian military. So you'd be entering into a kind of conspiracy. <laughs> Why would the Canadian government sign an agreement with every pizza restaurant in Canada where the sole exclusive purpose of this agreement is to provide you with cheaper cheese and yet you have to agree in signing this that the purpose of the agreement is not, not at all, to provide you with cheaper cheese. <laughs> the whole program only exists for that reason. Well, the Canadian government, as I mentioned, the, the big dates were 1999, 2002, They've been dragged into court again and again. And most of these, again, it's not a court in a simple sense. They're tribunals. But like the regular court system, a lot of the time the way governments settle these matters is by making a deal outside of court. If you live in Canada, you have seen many times the strange sight of advertisements for New Zealand butter. New Zealand dairy products are common in Canada. 
Why? Is it because New Zealand can produce butter more cheaply than Mexico? Is it because New Zealand can make butter more cheaply and export to Canada a better price in competition with Argentina, Brazil? No. That's the exact opposite of the truth. If we had a free market trade in dairy and beef, everyone in Canada would be eating beef and drinking milk from South America. The industry within Canada would collapse and the taxpayers would save a ton of money because they would no longer be subsidizing the most polluting, corrupt, immoral industries imaginable. And although I am vegan, I'm not going to start drinking milk or eating beef if we start importing it from Argentina. In many ways, you have to say there would be less entanglement, it would be less of a moral quandary if the Canadian government just opened up the borders and let that happen. But no, 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 no. Why is New Zealand butter the product on the shelves in Canada? Because of a 100% corrupt, somewhat secretive, somewhat conspiratorial deal that the Canadian government negotiated with the New Zealand government so that New Zealand would agree to stop having its lawyers press their case in the World Trade Organization court. New Zealand has a similar British colonial history to Canada. They understand the laws in Canada very well. They understand the rules of the World Trade Organization. And they were simply the country that had the chutzpah to take their lawyers and press the case against Canada to, to persecute or prosecute Canada, however you want to look at it, and say, you guys are breaking the rules and we know we can make money out of punishing you for breaking the rules on how you stuff money into the pockets of dairy farmers. <laughs> okay? The situation is, to some extent, the same in England and the United States. In the United States, is their dairy system is actually better managed. Um, one of the indirect effects of how all these countries subsidize dairy prices is also that all of these countries import uh, deluxe expensive dairy products from countries like France and Italy that otherwise they wouldn't import. If France and Italy had to compete with dramatically cheaper products from Argentina, it would be a different situation. But they don't. We have cheese that comes from France and is imported to Canada, and all it has to compete with is overly expensive Canadian cheese. So the prices are very competitive, even though French cheese should be much more expensive in Canada than a cheese that's made in Canada. It's not. Uh, the same is true, basically, with competition between the United States and Canada, which, as you can imagine, was negotiated in great depth over many years as to how Canada and the United States were going to cope with their separate and equal corrupt systems of dairy subsidy. Okay? Coming back to the question I raised at the beginning of this video, uh, I grew up in Canada. I heard many times, just in conversation, people claiming that the government made dairy cheaper, that the government was promoting dairy farmers and subsidizing dairy industry to make milk cheaper. However, the minute you start reading any kind of detailed article on this subject, whether it's in a magazine, a newspaper, what have you, you find claims, normally backed up with economic statistics, that the effect of the government subsidies is actually to raise prices, to make milk more expensive for the consumer. Um... So again, in almost any country in the world where you might be watching this video, what I'm about to say is going to be true. It's true in England, it's true in the United States, it's true in Canada, with only slight differences today. The main effect of government subsidy is to stabilize prices. And this has dramatic knock-on effects really throughout our whole society. Naturally, uh, in a free market, in some kind of intact ecosystem, the price of milk would be very unstable. Canada is a cold country. It's cold as hell in the winter. Do you think we would naturally produce the same amount of milk 12 months a year, year in and year out? No, we don't produce the same amount of wheat, or the same amount of corn 12 months a year, right? Naturally, there are going to be big variations with temperature, with the weather, with the harvest season, ultimately with the cycle of life for the cattle who are not absolutely continuously pregnant 
This is a horrible system of impregnating them repeatedly and so on and so forth. If you're vegan, you already know. If you don't already know, check out a short documentary like From Farm to Fridge. And you can behold the horrors of the modern industrialized dairy system. Um, the main impact of government subsidy is to even out, is to create an artificially constant price uh, for all dairy products. And that is fundamentally why, if you go to a corner store, dairy is in everything. If the supply was uneven, was inconsistent, if sometimes you could get dairy and sometimes you couldn't, as, a, as an industry, as a manufacturer, even if it were cheaper on average, that would mean that you couldn't really consistently rely on milk solids and other dairy products to go into chocolate bars and candy and, I don't know, toothpaste. I mean, dairy is used in manufacturing an unbelievable array of products in the modern Western world, and most of them don't need it. You know, it's, you know, as a vegan, you're used to this. You read the labels on things, and you figure out just how many crazy products have dairy added to them, often a, a desiccated uh, milk powder, milk solids, milk fat, milk, milk protein. So that's the big knock-on effect in America, Canada, Britain, and in all the countries that imitated our system, is that a product that naturally would be perishable, milk doesn't keep for very long, inconsistently available, and would naturally have a fluctuating price, instead is artificially made into having a very consistent, predictable price, and then later stages of industry all find ways to make use of it with this reassurance that the price will be the same in summer as in winter and that their access to this product is going to be mathematically predictable. Uh, in Canada, most of the time, the effect of dairy subsidy is actually to make milk more expensive for the consumer. So again, that's different from the effect for the owner of a chocolate factory or some other, you know, manufacturer producing things out of dairy products. But yes, uh, you can look at the price charts where you have a straight line for the imposed price that the Canadian government creates, and where you can look at when the world price, as it's called, would be higher or lower than that. Now, the problem is the world price includes places like Argentina. Um, you can also look at American prices. You can look at kind of theoretical prices of if we just had free trade between the United States and Canada, etc. Um, uh, in, in the last 30 years, almost all the time, uh, the, for the end consumer, dairy would be cheaper. Um, you did have some periods of time where the world price spiked up above and then dropped again but most of the time it would be cheaper. However, the reason why I made the point about it being more reliable this way is even more important. If we really lived in a world without government subsidy, without government interference in how dairy production works, then we would live in a world where sometimes your grandmother would go to the store and ask for milk, and they would say, we don't have any. Especially if you lived in a small town in Canada. You know, Toronto is our biggest city. Probably Toronto would have dairy products all the time under a free market. But if you got out into smaller towns, into Collingwood, into Kitimat, into Attawapiskat, some of those places would probably have no milk at all, or they'd only have milk once in a while, or probably people who wanted to drink milk would tell the guy at the store, oh, the next time you get milk, can you give me a phone call? Can you send me an email? And of course, if you read just historical fiction, or any kind of history, whether it's novels or nonfiction, in most countries in Europe, not too long ago, not too many centuries ago, that was the way milk was regarded. Even if you live near dairy farms, it doesn't come with mathematical regularity. Sometimes it's available and sometimes it's not. And that's another reason why in the pre-modern world, we didn't have all of these industries relying on dairy all the time. Okay, my final point is, what's the point of abolishing dairy subsidies, apart from saving money for the taxpayer, which is something that the left wing, the right wing, and everybody in between can agree is a good idea. The most fundamental benefit, whether you're vegan or not, whether you're a meat eater and a milk drinker or not, 
is that when you disentangle government from industry, you get better accountability for both government and industry. When the government is making money by propping up industry, and when industry is making money by exploiting the government, neither party is really going to do the right thing. They're not going to do the right thing for consumers. They're not going to do the right thing for the cows. Not going to do the right thing for the environment. And they're not even going to do the right thing in terms of business sense and being uh, the most efficient, most optimized way to uh, produce dairy products going. Um, it would not be a utopian dream to imagine that in the future, countries like the United States and Canada simply get rid of the enormously wasteful, enormously expensive bureaucracy that currently props up the local dairy industry. And that they accept the fact that, guess what? I mean, Quebec is cold as hell in winter. And people in Quebec import cheese from France because France makes some of the best cheese in the world. Ain't nobody in France importing cheese from Canada, right? If we got rid of these sorts of controls, then naturally Canadians would, on the one hand, import dairy products from the countries that can produce them the most cheaply, which would not be Canada. It would be South America and Latin America. And on the other hand, would import dairy products from countries that produce them at the highest standard of excellence. So France and Italy. But guess what? Overall dairy consumption would decline. Access to dairy products would become more natural in a free market sense of the price rising and falling inconsistently, availability not being 365 days a year, etc. Dairy would become a luxury product again instead of something that people are expected to eat three meals a day at a very low level of quality.